Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome virtually to Brookings. My name is Sanjay Patnag, and I'm the Director of the Center on Regulation and Markets here at Brookings. I'm very pleased that you have chosen to join us today for this really important event. We are here to discuss artificial intelligence and upskilling, or the development of additional skills for employees and uh, talented uh, um, people to, to move up in the uh, career scale. And we are honored to have several high-level experts with us today who are particularly well-equipped to provide their insights on the topic. For our keynote address, we welcome Andrew Eng, founder of Deep Learning AI, co-founder and chairman of Coursera and general partner of AI Fund. Our moderators will be Alberto Rossi, professor and director of the AI Analytics and Future of Work Initiative at Georgetown University, and Lonnie Mahant, the non-resident fellow in the Center on Regulation and Markets at Brookings. As our panelists, we are very happy to welcome Gad Lebanon, Chief Economist at Burning Glass Institute, Morgan Frank, Assistant Professor at University of Pittsburgh, and David Estrada, Chief Legal and Policy Officer of Neuro Inc. At this point, I would also like to note that Neuro provides financial support to the Center on Regulation and Markets, which helps make the work we do possible. I would like to reiterate Brookings commitment to independence and underscore that the views expressed today are solely those of the speaker. Rapid advances in artificial intelligence and other new technologies, such as advanced automation, robotics, and autonomous vehicles will have a significant impact on our economic, political, and social systems, and particularly on labor markets. This raises important questions on whether and how new technology impacts the need for employees to gain additional skills or retrain to succeed in an economy of the future. An increasing number of companies are pursuing such upskilling or reskilling initiatives and highlighting the importance of advancing our knowledge in this policy and research. I very much look forward to the remarks by our speakers and the ensuing discussion today. And I'm now going to turn it over to our keynote speaker, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, it's good to be here with all of you, see the huge impact that um, Brookings has and uh, just looking forward to speaking with all of you here today. Um, so there's been a lot of hype through AI, about AI. What I hope to do is spend a bit of time today sharing with you what I think is actually happening with AI technology, where it's not yet working, where I think it will work in the future. Um, and then hopefully together, you know, in, in Q&A or, or the panel to follow and talk through some of the implications of this AI technology on the workforce and on upskilling. When I think about AI technology, um, I often think through two lenses. One is tools, and second is training or education. And let me start with saying a little bit more about tools. Um, I've been saying for several years, AI is the new electricity, much like electricity about 100 years ago transformed the economy. AI is, seems to be on the path to do the same. But despite all the excitement about AI, I think that in most industries, it is not widespread and is not widely used today yet. So I gave a TED talk recently that was just posted online a few days ago, you can find it online, where I spoke about um, the, my often buying a slice of Hawaiian pizza from a pizza joint, you know, kind of a, a, a 10 minutes drive, a few minutes drive from my house. And it turns out that that single owner, proprietor of a small pizza store, um, he does have data. He has actually decent amounts of sales data. And if he had access to AI, I'm pretty sure he could optimize the supply chain, have less, you know, cold pizza lying around. But frankly, um, other than large internet, consumer internet companies especially, and other than leading tech companies, AI is not, from where I'm sitting, widely used. Um, and so what is, what, why is that? And what, what is the roadmap to get AI to be more widespread across society? Which will happen, but, but, but why aren't we there yet? I wanna share with you what I think of as the two key barriers to AI adoption. Um, first is small data sets. So when I was working for a large consumer internet company, I once built a face recognition system using 350 images, pictures of faces. When I was um, speaking at a manufacturing conference, uh, some, you know, some, a little bit back, I asked this manufacturing audience, how many images do you typically have of defects you want to detect? One of the teams works on um, helping manufacturers take pictures of things they're making, say a smartphone or whatever, and using that picture to decide if the smartphone is scratched. But when I asked this question of a manufacturing audience um, here in the United States, this was the answer, 50 or fewer images. And it turns out that technology, you know, that I and my friends had, had contributed in building for working with hundreds of millions of data points, it doesn't work um, 
for other industries. It turns out this is solvable, but there are a lot of industries where data set sizes are just much smaller. In healthcare, I've seen a lot of problems where you only have 100 images of a rare medical condition, and you just got to make it work with 100 images, not 100 million images. Um, the second barrier to widespread AI adoption, again, this is a problem we will solve as a community, is the customization or the long tail problem. So if you take all current and potential AI projects and sort them in decreasing order of value, you get the distribution that looks like this with a long tail. Maybe the single most valuable AI system in the world is some online ad system. Maybe the second most valuable is some giant web search system. Maybe the third most valuable is some e-commerce online shopping product recommendation system. But um, <clears throat> so the AI world has figured out how to hire dozens or sometimes hundreds of engineers to build a giant monolithic AI system to serve a hundred million or a billion users. And the economics of that works out. But once you go to other industries, you rarely have a hundred million users in one database. And so in manufacturing, for example, I would see a company making pharmaceutical pills and they need an AI system to inspect pills or different AI manufacturer may need to inspect sheets of steel. Different uh, manufacturer may need to inspect semiconductor wafers. And it turns out that because every factory makes something different, every factory needs the custom trained, custom AI system to do the thing that they need, which is different from everyone else. And so from where I'm sitting, I see the, let's call it 100 million or the billion dollar AI projects built well, but I see also a lot of one to $5 million AI projects um, that are sitting around because no one's yet figured out the economics for how they make them work. I think the way the AI, the, the way the AI world is moving to address this problem, and this has implications of the workforce and upskilling as well, is to build vertical platforms. And what I mean is vertical platforms that enable the end customer to build the custom AI system that they need. Because rather than say me going to you know, every manufacturing plant um, and me trying to have my team build a custom AI system, if there become new generations of tools that let the IT personnel in different manufacturing plants build their own custom AI systems, then that will get a lot more of these AI systems built to serve all these use cases in the long tail. And this is, you know, clear implications as well for the skill set needed for all of the, say, IT personnel in all the manufacturing plants, um, as well as much more broadly, as, as, as you see in a second. And it turns out the key technology to make this possible, you know, maybe we've been told building AI is hard, you know, you need an advanced degree or whatever, which, which is actually not true. But, um, but it turns out that the key technology for enabling a much larger fraction of our workforce to have the skills to build and participate in not just using AI systems, but building custom AI systems um, is, is technology to let them engineer the data rather than the code. I'll come back to this in a second. This technology called data-centric AI development. But just to cast the net a little bit wider than just um, inspection, um, if we were to look at a, a hypothetical t-shirt maker, you know, what can a small t-shirt maker do using AI? Um, demand forecasting, right? Look at sales data, look at demand data, social media tweets, figure out what's, what, what is likely demand for different t-shirt designs. Uh, product placement, um, how do you merchandise? How do you decide where to place the products? To supply chain, manage the complexity of supply chain. So you place the right orders, get the right cloth, get the right products. Um, and then also quality control. Uh, if you're making a t-shirt, how do you know if the t-shirt cloth is in high quality or does this cloth have a tear or discoloration in it? So what I see is that um, all businesses from the very large companies, like the giant internet companies, all the way down to a sole proprietor pizzeria to a mid-sized t-shirt maker with maybe hundreds of employees, all of these companies have many, many possible use cases for AI, um, but because the bulk of AI projects or just a large number of AI projects are in the tail, then many of these one to $5 million projects that, that frankly no one is working on. And we need the workforce with the tools as well as the training um, either or, or both um, in order to, to create this value. So until now, for the most part, building the AI system means writing pages of pages of codes. And um, I've been you know, encouraged by the rise in coding literacy. 
uh, but the number of software engineers, the number of AI developers is far smaller than the number of people that hope will rise to, the, rise to being able to do the work to build custom AI systems. When I think about the rise of AI, I often think about the rise of literacy in human society. Um, hundreds of years ago, many people in society thought that maybe not everyone needed to be literate. Not everyone needed to read and write. Perhaps we could all just go to the you know, holy temple or the holy building and sit in the audience and listen to the monks or the high priests and priestesses read some holy book to us. And that was enough. Why do you need to read for yourself if you could just do that? But fortunately, we figured out that um, if almost everyone in society is literate and can read and write, we can build a much richer society. What I see in AI today is most of us are, you know, most people are leaving it to the high priests and priestesses in the large tech companies to write code for everyone else. Um, and if you can use code written by a large tech company, why do you need to build custom AI for yourself? But the problem with this is this is not rising to solve the huge number of applications in that long tail, which I think may create even more value for society. And also importantly, make sure that value is spread widely and fairly um, than just solving the applications in the, in the head, the, the small number of very valuable applications. So I wanna share with you um, two upcoming trends in AI technology that I think will address all these applications in the long tail and without needing everyone to be an expert software engineer. Um, one is data-centric AI technology, and here's the idea. So you might know that building an AI system requires both writing code uh, writing software to implement some AI algorithm or some you know, machine learning model, as well as taking that code to having it learn from data. So the conventional approach to AI development, which my community has used for the last many decades, has been the code-centric approach, where the view is you get the data from somewhere, maybe download the data set off the internet, and then let's work really, really hard on the code to make the AI work on the data we have. Because of this paradigm of development, it turns out that for the large majority, maybe the vast majority of practical commercial applications of AI today, the code, the neural network model, the advanced deep learning technology is basically a solved problem, right? There are exceptions, but for most commercial applications you might think about, um, quality inspection or demand forecasting or product placements or um, uh, all, all those applications, there's an open source piece of code on the internet, you know, open source neural network model on the internet that will work well enough. And so the data-centric AI movement is developing new principles and technologies to let teams um, use a good implementation of some codes of some AI software, but to get teams to focus their attention on entering the data. And I find this recipe promising because if you go to the um, IT personnel of a manufacturing plant and you ask them to write code to invent the next generation of a deep learning neural network technology, that's pretty challenging. But if you ask them to express the domain knowledge about what they're making through creating and labeling data, that is a much easier way for them to succeed. So let me just show you a quick um, video of, a, of an example of this. This is software made by one of my teams, Landing AI, that illustrates a data-centric approach to AI, where if you're a t-shirt maker and you want to build a custom AI system to your cloth for defects, then you upload a bunch of images and then you will you know, draw rectangles uh, like this to tell the AI system, where is there a tear? And where is there a discoloration in a piece of cloth? And data-centric AI means that domain experts that know what is a defect can spend their time expressing the knowledge of what is good cloth, what is bad cloth through engineering the data. And this makes it much more accessible. And after labeling data and training AI system, you can then you know, build an AI system um, that can then help you find defects in, in, in pieces of cloth. So data-centric AI is a um, important technology direction that will be key to democratizing access to AI. Um, I wanna share with you a second technology direction that I think is, is exciting and, and important, um, which is prompt engineering. So uh, shown on the left, my, I have a daughter that loves pandas for some strange reason. And so sometimes I you know, lie and sit on a sofa and, and draw pandas to amuse her. So the picture on the left is one that I somewhat embarrassingly drew in about 10 minutes to entertain my daughter. Uh, in my defense, she was poking me nonstop 
through that 10 minutes. I had to defend myself while drawing, but I know it looks bad. Uh, the image on the right was computer generated in mere seconds. So just for fun, I thought I would show you a demo um, of, of you know, some examples of prompt engineering. Uh, this is not my software, um, so if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. Uh, but this is a website. It's a, prompt engineering is exciting. It's, it's, it's kind of very buzzy technology. Um, and one of the PR buzzy releases was by a company called Stable Diffusion, where you can type in a prompt. By the way, if any of the panelists or whatever wants to give me a prompt or so anyone on Zoom chat, you know, so this is a suggested prompt by the website. And when I click dream, it, you know, so this image had never existed. It was just generated in the last uh, 10 seconds, right? So um, a happy panda with colorful. And so the UI has transformed from um, pen and paper uh, or pen and stylus, which is what I use, to if you can write a prompt, write a little piece of English text, um, um, then you could generate art like this. And this particular UI, um, this is a very buzzy technology, you know. Let's, let's make it a robot instead of a panda, right? And I feel like many people have the creativity to, and you know, let's do another one. Many people have the creativity to generate art, but not the technical skill. I'm not good at drawing. I try, but I'm not good at it. But I think many of you watching this have the creativity, but not necessarily. Okay, Sanjay just gave me the prompt. I'm going to, and oops, sorry. An ancient explorer gazing out over the sea. Hope I type that right. We'll see. Um, so the Sanjay just gave me this prompt, right? We'll see what happens. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, not bad. All right, Morgan Frank says, oh, that's interesting. Freddie Mercury dancing with the moon. Hopefully I transcribed that correctly. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Right, so, so, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, the, the, thank, thank you, Morgan and Sanjay for the prompts. Pretty amazing the results you can get with a, with a system like this. For what this worth, I think the UI is in a very nascent phase. Um, this is buzzy technology. Tons of teams are exploring commercial applications, how to commercialize this. OpenAI's DALI has released this. Google has its own version, Imogen, but the stable diffusion because of the way they release the software. Um, kind of letting people download it and run it uh, has, has been leading to, to a lot of creativity. Um, and then just to show you a second example of prompt engineering, this is um, OpenAI's uh, uh, GPT-3 model, which you may have read about in the news. So here, actually, this is a the write a tagline for an ice cream shop. So I'll write a tagline for a, I don't know. Uh, yeah, sure, just exploration. Actually, uh, let, me, let me just say for a shoe company. Sometimes it gives a good answer, sometimes it doesn't. Right? Well, it shoes make you feel like you work on air. You know, best shoes in the world. Nah, it's not that creative. Okay, not bad, right? I, I, you know, pick, picture someone with a, the only thing better than our shoes is your small. It, it, it could work. I'm not a good marketer, you know, you can imagine. Um, but in fact, let me try something else. So let me actually, um, let's see. Let me go to the, um, Brookings Institution website. Right. And, um, oh, is this the right website? Okay. Um, yeah, all right. So this is, So if I were to take some text and paste it here and ask it to continue writing this, uh, all this is fictitious or you know, made up. I don't, don't take anything here as factual, right? You know, President Biden declared blah, blah, blah. 
again, this is plausible sounding text, right? Uh, this is made up, so I don't, please don't take anything here as, as accurate, but it's, you know, I've seen um, this type of technology write, you know, surprisingly plausible, um, sorry, just to give you a little bit longer, to, surprisingly plausible um, copy, right? Um, and so, um, I feel like this type of UI or prompt engineering, it opens up accessibility of um, this type of, you know, I don't know if you call it creative writing or, 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 or something else, opens up this type of uh, creative things to a lot more people. Um, so, so just to wrap up quickly, I was chatting with uh, uh, Daniel Rock from University of Pennsylvania, and, and uh, he you know, made an interesting comment. The nice thing about tools is it is upskilling by default, right? With better tools, everyone is, is upskilled by default. And just to relate this back to, so, so I think tools and training, tools is a really important part of letting everyone in society do more powerful things. Um, and, and just my last slide on more conventional upskilling training, which I think is very important as well. What I see is that AI is raising the bar for everyone. The world we live in is highly digital. Our activities generate digital data as an exhaust. And so new AI capabilities means that no matter what industry, what sector you work in, you probably have data and teams are able to use that data will be more competitive than teams are not, that, that, that are not. Data-centric AI, maybe tools like prompt engineering will enable a lot more people to do that. But this basic new capability is pushing everyone to, you know, giving everyone the opportunity as well to do more. Um, from Coursera's data, this is from Coursera's uh, uh, impact report, 92% of Coursera's business learners report a positive career outcome from uh, uh, after completing an online course. And so I find that upskilling, it does work. Um, but the flip side is upskilling is still very challenging for many managers, right? So, so this is a, a Coursera user research data. I don't think we've ever, don't think Coursera has released this publicly, but maybe not surprisingly, you know, when, when someone has their annual performance conversation with their manager, only I would say 23%, 24% really set them on a clear path on how to develop, maybe over 50% have some path, but this is a very challenging activity, even though you know, our data shows that when you invest in it and you do it, that it does benefit the individual uh, uh, significantly. And, and usually I think it benefits the organizations as well. Um, but I think a lot of the demand for upskilling is also driven by the new capabilities. Um, so, so I think that uh, figuring out the right paths to society and the right policies and the right way to approach this, you're know, excited to engage in that discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the fantastic uh, presentation. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, if you don't, please let me know. But um, yeah, I think that uh, you you ended up exactly where I wanted to pick it up from uh, this, which is kind of the implementation of upskilling within firms. So what are the different forms of upskilling that firms engage in? So are they mainly outsourced through outside vendors? and perform online or through university, or are they performed internally by the companies themselves? Yeah, you know, so I think directionally in the last decade, um, my sense is more and more of it has been outsourced and, and for the reason of um, the internet. So, you know, 30 years ago, companies used to write their own HR software because before the internet, you couldn't get access to really good HR software or really good whatever software, really good email software. So firms were managing their own email systems in house. Because of the internet, we now can get good access to a lot of the best tools anywhere in the world. And also um, the rapid pace of upskilling means that there's a lot of knowledge that firms are partnering, you know, with, with a university or with a company like Coursera or deeplearning.ai, right? Com full disclosure, companies I'm affiliated with, um, in order to drive that upskilling. And I see a lot of efficiency in bringing outside knowledge in. And, and of course, there is often some amount of in-house knowledge uh, uh, that is, you know, specific to the firm. And it turns out that there are benefits both to the company and the individual um, have that specialization, they have that fit between the company mm -hmm. and the individual as well. But um, I think directionally, more and more of it has been ingesting outside knowledge. I should go to CLOs and I tell them that the smart CLOs, chief learning officers, 
the job is more to curate rather than to create content because creation of content is so expensive. Um, whereas selecting the right content allows you to bring it in uh, much more, much, much more inexpensively. Perfect. And when you collaborate with companies, uh, do you want to kind of their employees to their employees? Is it something that is fully automated? Is it something that the Coursera or Deep Learning AI provides? Oh boy. Um, so I think that uh, uh, online companies, online ed tech companies like Coursera has a very large content library, but I find that most corporations will want to look at the content library and customize it for their needs. Um, so I see, for example, a lot of companies um, feel like they want to improve data literacy across the entire organization, not just engineering, but we live in a world where if your recruiters and marketers and product managers have that basically data literacy, you'd be better off. Or some companies want to um, improve the business skills or the soft skills of specific teams. So many companies will um, try to find great education, you know, from the best universities or the best uh, uh, corporations that are highly qualified to teach this but then also match that to their specific needs. And so that process often results in a better experience for the, for the learner uh, inside the corporation. Um, hope, that, hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you touched upon uh, on your presentation, but if, if AI continues to advance in future years, how, what would that mean for the pace of upskilling going forward? Yeah, you know, I feel like people sometimes have a dystopian um, picture of AI-driven global technological unemployment. Um, I certainly don't see that. Uh, I, I feel like we often this, this, don't always remember that new technologies historically has typically created you know, as many or often even more jobs than, than it affected. Um, so I'm seeing that to be true for uh, AI as well. AI is transforming many jobs, but so long as the corporations and individuals are willing to invest in their people, or hire and invest in hire new skills in and invest in their people, seems to be plenty of work for everyone. Um, U.S. unemployment rate is now what is it three point seven percent or something? Uh, so hardly any of us, many corporations are struggling to find qualified individuals um, uh, to fill the open positions. But then there is, but as we all know, there is a huge gap right between the skills that the workforce has and the ideal set of skills that we wish the entire workforce had. So the only solution to that, I think, is to provide upskilling and training. You know, one of the inefficiencies that I think is quite tragic for education is that um, it has some short-term ROI. You know, the Coursera data shows, right? Six months, often you see a benefit for the individual's career. So there is some short-term ROI. But a lot of the ROI of upskilling training is, is long-term. And, and I mean, high quality training. We know that we, we, we know about the college debt problem and you have an expensive degree that doesn't give you meaningful skills. That's a huge problem that we need to solve as a society. But good education has a, you know, some short-term ROI and a profound long-term ROI. And because of that economic recipe, I see us as a society over and over under investing um, um, in education. And this goes all the way back to um, uh, early childhood education, where frankly, we know that making sure that children are well-fed and get an education, you know, when they're right in, in like uh, kindergarten, that has a fantastic ROI, but how do you pay for it? So a lot of this feels like it should be a public good, but on the flip side, I'm happy to see many corporations stepping in and many employees pushing the corporations to invest, you know, for the benefit of the employee and the benefit of the corporation. But I don't, I, I feel like globally dialing up the volume of training um, creates a lot of public uh, benefits as well as private benefits. Yeah, thank you. And just a one last question uh, is exactly about this uh, ability of employees to learn, right? We know that some employees are going to be better at learning new skills. Some instead are not going to be as uh, able to do it. So what is the solution for companies? Are they, are they going to have to engage in some layoffs and hiring fresh new talent? Are they going to be trying to redeploy the, these employees in different areas? Yeah, I think that this is a very challenging uh, uh, question that many companies have to address. I see companies face the corporate reality of, you know, needing to needing to be profitable and and frankly to not go bankrupt, and so that drives certain 
economics, I also see a lot of managers, a lot of sympathy, rightly so, for the employees whose jobs are displaced and that may or may not be in a position in life um, to spend the time to invest in their own education and training, even while maintaining a full-time job. I mean, you know, I'm very sympathetic to, there are individuals in society, you know, that because of their personal lives or health or other obligations may not be in a position at that very moment to make the long-term investments in their own training that's good for them and good for society. So I feel like this is partly a question of um, can society create an appropriate safety net so that people that have the bandwidth and the capacity can keep on learning and growing? But if someone just is not in a position to put in that work to make sure that part, part, part of me feels like, you know, just because someone does not have the skills needed for, for, for the job and where the job has gone, to me, it does not mean they deserve to be thrown out onto the street to die, right? So, so I feel like our society is not that good. And I wish we were collectively better at creating that, um, creating enough of a safety net and then also giving people an opportunity while you know protected by a little bit of safety net to upskill so that they could have a path back to, to being, uh, contributing significantly to, to, to society and to themselves and their families and the communities. I find, I, I find us as a, as a society pretty bad at, at, at helping individuals navigate that journey. Partly, I think, is because of the long-term versus short-term payoff. Um, I'm happy to see many governments, uh, local governments, state governments stepping in, but I think we have a lot more work to do there. Thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, on this note, I think this is all the time we have. Let me thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. And let me hand it over to Loni Mahanta, who is going to moderate the panel. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, everyone. All right, everybody. I'm um, looking forward to our conversation here. Um, I'd like to start us off by hearing just some top line perspectives from uh, from each of you, Gad, Morgan, and David, around you know what what are your thoughts, high level around AI and upskilling, and then we can take it uh, take it from there. Um, Gad, could you start us off? Sure, and thank you very much for having me today. It's uh, been uh, exciting and interesting so far, and I'm sure it will continue to be. Um, so I, I think that the topic of upskilling and, and the technology and AI, um, there may be uh, three things, three types of, of considerations or occasions where that uh, is an important conversation. One is when uh, we're thinking about uh, shifting away from automated or obsolete jobs, uh, how can we upskill or reskill um, workers to, to um, other jobs? The second is all those new jobs that are created by AI and technology. How can we reskill and upskill for those jobs? And, and the third is uh, how can we reskill uh, workers towards uh, jobs that are in shortage? And I think uh, nowadays, in the, certainly in the past year, but even before the pandemic, probably the third one is the most important because we are having uh, probably the most severe labor shortage in uh, US history. Um, it's not just because of the pandemic, it's all kind of a uh, long run trends in demographics and uh, education and labor force participation. So we are now and probably for the foreseeable future, we are in a massive uh, shortage. And I think a lot of the reskilling, upskilling should be um, in that context of how we can uh, get more workers to the jobs that have the biggest shortages. And there I'm thinking about uh, anything related to healthcare or mental health related jobs, skilled trades, um, and some, but not all of tech jobs. Uh, it turns out that a lot of people, young generation are moving into uh, tech jobs and they, um, and those are, many of them are not the most uh, um, affected by labor shortages. Mm. Uh, so I think moving um, more workers into jobs that are in large shortages is an important uh, goal for our economy. Thank you. Morgan, you have some, share some of your thoughts? Sure. Uh, so I'm really interested in how technology uh, really impacts 
labor demands and the labor force in the U.S. by really small microscopic changes to what types of worker abilities and skills are in demand in the workplace. And yet we talk about these macroscopic trends that result from these small perturbations from technological change, for example. So things like job polarization uh, and the effectiveness of higher education, these are big macroscopic questions. But if you pick any specific technology, uh, like, like forward diffusion that Andrew was showing us, it's a really specific task that it's doing in the grand scheme of all the things workers might do. So what this says to me is that we need some better insights into what are the specific skills and abilities that workers leverage mm -hmm. and how do they get bundled together? And I think that by understanding these microscopic elements in our labor systems, different labor markets across the US, for example, we can start to better understand what pathways for career mobility workers have access to and where bottlenecks exist. For example, what types of specific skills should be taught to a worker based on what they already know. Uh, part of this perspective enables us to consider some other things that I think are really important, like uh, the, context, the context really matters. So you could imagine that being very strong in computer programming creates a different type of career mobility if you're in Silicon Valley compared to if you're located in a rural community. Another example that doesn't have to do with tech, you could imagine that fossil fuel workers in Texas face a very different future than fossil fuel workers in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, because of policy considerations and push towards uh, just transition towards emerging green jobs. So context matters here and by in improving our data and insights into skills and how skills create these systemic opportunities and bottlenecks, we're going to be able to better respond to differential impact across different parts of the US. The other thing that this perspective leverages that I'm really interested in is we have all this information now about employment and skills and how those elements interact across different parts of the labor market or different cities and so on. But we don't have similar data for key parts of workforce development. For example, uh, what skills are really uh, only available through higher education? And what are the differences in the skills and abilities that are taught across different options for workforce development, maybe just different colleges that contribute or perhaps diminish the polar income inequality and differential access to opportunity that we see across the U.S. Great. Look forward to digging in on, on, on a lot of that. David, um, any, any word if you want to start us off? Yeah, thank you. Um, excited to be here. Thank you. I, I'd like to just put it in context for Neuro, what Neuro is doing. So Neuro is an autonomous vehicles company. We're building software, we're building sensors, we're building the vehicles themselves, and we're focused specifically on delivery. So we partner with companies, say like Uber Eats, who we just recently announced a partnership with. And, and so we will be actually delivering food to people who, who order it online through various partners and other goods as well. How does AI play in? Well, AI powers the learning models in our autonomous vehicles for perception, prediction, and planning. To build those models, we need highly skilled and well-trained engineers, and those engineers are in short supply. Uh, I'd point out that currently uh, it's, it's about 30% of our workforce working on, on these programs to power up vehicles who rely on work visas from other countries. Our country, the United States, is not producing enough skilled labor in this, um, in this field, and we need to address that. There's also the question of whether four-year degrees are necessary in, in this emerging technology. And some and in some entities, I think Coursera, and there's another one, Udacity, who are for, focusing on small learning, um, some are called nano degrees, where, for example, you can go learn a specific programming language, and you can go be very valuable in a company like Neuro. Now, I'd like to focus on these aren't just tech jobs. When, when neuro deploys, for example, we will be upscaling and creating new jobs in a many fields. We will work into communities. We will be upskilling instead of uprooting. And so, for example, if you imagine we go work with our partners in Houston, Texas, we are establishing a base of operations there. There will be people in grocery stores picking and packing new jobs that didn't exist before. There will be people who need to maintain our vehicles. And we actually have created a technician program with the Anza Community College where people can go there, take a very specific class and gain the skills necessary to be a hired by us so that they can work on these vehicles. 
we actually commissioned a study with the steer group that showed that over the over a period of about 10 years of rolling this all out, about 3 million net new jobs will be created. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about AI being the core of unleashing many, many new jobs with automation. All right, awesome. Um, let's just start with a little bit of like a, a prefatory question here, which is, you know, what is what is automation going to do uh, for jobs of today? And you know, are, are there going to be wholesale job losses due to automation? Gad, I'd love your take um, as a labor economist. You know, what are you seeing? You know, we've discussed you know, labor productivity. What does that mean for replacement of workers with automation or some of the new technology that's coming? Yeah, well, we, we can't really measure the amount of automation in the economy directly. So what economists uh, do instead is, is they focus on a labor productivity, which is not uh, exactly automation, but it is a, a good proxy because the more automation you have, the more uh, one worker on average can accomplish uh, in one hour of uh, work, which is the measure of productivity. And when we look at labor productivity, um, the numbers are actually uh, disappointing. So in the decade before the pandemic, we had uh, the weakest labor productivity growth in US history. Uh, and there were a lot of hopes that uh, with the pandemic and all the strong uh, focus on a digital transformation and investment in uh, technology, that we will see a, a bump um, in uh, labor productivity, but so far we haven't seen that uh, either. Um, there's a big uh, debate on, on why uh, we are seeing those trends. And I think that the main reason is simply uh, low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit of replacing workers with technology already took place before 2010. Mm. And, and since then, it's becoming harder and harder to replace the next worker with technology. Uh, and that's uh, one of the main reasons why we don't see it. Uh, there are uh, some exceptions. And I think uh, during the pandemic, customers and individuals became much more um, tech savvy. So for example, in uh, uh, cashing a check, uh, a lot of people didn't know how to do it uh, automatically uh, or online. Uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, and they went to banks to do it, and now many more do know how to do it. So I do think we see a lot of uh, jobs in commercial banking, like bank tellers being uh, uh, replaced right now. Um, so I do think there is uh, some potential, but uh, I, I do think uh, the days of massive automation and replacing of workers with technology are, are mostly behind us. Morgan, your work has demonstrated that the numbers don't always paint a fully accurate picture of what is happening with jobs that are being, you know, lost or replaced with new workers. How, you know, how, how should we think about what the data is, is shows, shows us? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think that like Gad's comments about, well, we have productivity as kind of one measure for what automation is doing it gives us really just one perspective and maybe a perspective that's more important for the firm and maybe less focused on what the workers are experiencing. Mm. Uh, so another natural question is wh what is technology doing to employment and what is it, is it removing the need for job titles or jobs just disappearing? And I think the answer in both cases is largely no, there isn't widespread unemployment and it's pretty rare for job titles to disappear. Uh, but this sort of creates a bit of a funny situation if you think about how much technology has evolved in just the last 20 years. Think about how much the internet has changed. We have machine learning doing things that felt impossible 10 years ago. Like look at the stable diffusion example and the GPT-3 example that Andrew was showing us. These are like magic. Uh, so it seems sort of paradoxical that occupations don't disappear and yet so much changes. So I think most of what's going on is that technology is changing the demand for really specific capabilities and skills, and that what it means to have a certain job title adapts accordingly. So this is like within occupation changes to skill requirements. This can still create costs, even if it doesn't create unemployment. You can imagine a scenario where the individual worker has to work very hard 
to keep up with whatever the current in-demand skills are. And so it's constant reskilling and constantly being aware of what the frontier of knowledge is. And as a professor doing research, I, I can attest that this is quite difficult. Um, but this can create a lot of other costly things beyond just skills. You can imagine, for example, that a worker is unable to reskill. They lose their job or they quit their job. Uh, and they're hired by a new employee who is able to complement technology. This type of dynamic seems perfectly plausible. It would produce job separations, uh, but you could imagine it increases, decreases, or has no actual effect on the aggregate employment or unemployment mm -hmm. by occupation. So I think what we really need to get at this question of what will the real world effects of new technology be kind of requires some more nuanced data that tells us more insights into how skills map to the capabilities of technology, and also more information about how those skills and abilities and those technologies uh, differential are, are sort of spread out different, differently across different labor markets, across different occupations, and if possible, even across different firms that, that employ uh, workers with similar job titles. You can imagine that every company employs secretaries, but maybe what secretaries are doing varies pretty significantly from industry to industry or even firm to firm. David, I think you touched on this a little bit, but you know, I think that there might be um, a picture that um, autonomous vehicles are going to take away jobs from human drivers. Uh, how does neuro see that uh, perspective? Well, what we see, what we see out there already is that there's surging demand at a time of, of a shrinking or a labor force that isn't growing fast enough. So for example, if, if you go and you, um, if you want to take an Uber or a Lyft today, you see that the prices are going up in some cases, very significantly along with inflation in most of the country. In many places, these are being unaffordable rides. Part of what's driving that is there simply are not enough drivers. There's a huge truck driver shortage as well. There's also a huge okay. shortage of pilots for airplanes. So we don't have enough people to move around all these vehicles at a time when there's gonna be incredibly increasing demand for delivery. And so we see this issue and, and think about it in uh, the context, for instance, of ATMs. ATMs was one of the very first forms of automation that we all came into contact with. Instead of walking into a bank, you were able to use an ATM and, and go grab your cash and not go into a bank. A lot of people were worried at the time that this would kill jobs for tellers. What it actually did is it caused ba banks to dramatically expand the number of, of small branches that they had throughout the country, and especially in underserved areas. And in those underserved areas, there were some teller jobs. Now, overall, the total number of teller jobs has increased since then. It hasn't decreased. Mm -hmm. So similarly, in our field, we're going to see that there's a lot more delivery happening. There's a lot more paid rides happening. And there will be a mix of both rides and deliveries happening with human drivers and those happening with automated drivers. Mm. Okay. You know, we got a lot of great questions from the audience. I'll ask some at the end, but I also, there's some that were a lot of thematic questions. So I'll kind of intersperse them a little bit as we're talking here. But one of the questions that came up a lot was, you know, what are the areas or industries that um, this uh, panel thinks might be most likely to be impacted? I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm really excited for what's going to happen in medicine uh, in the next few years. Uh, it's a it's a data rich part of society that has been very safeguarded. And so as we come up with uh, ethical, safe, uh, secure ways to make that data available to the people who can apply engineer, uh, AI systems to it and engineer these these data driven systems, I think we're going to see all kinds of new abilities popping out in the area of medicine. It's going to create opportunities to study, for example, these rare diseases where it might be hard for an individual to go out and locate a handful of people with the same condition. But when you have access to mm. wealth of data available and automated systems that can start to relate cases to one another, you just imagine that alone creates an opportunity to address fringe medical scenarios. So I'm very excited about uh, what medical technology will look like in the next 10 years. Okay. Um, okay. So we have, you know, some 
thoughts around some portion of jobs are going to be shifting, maybe not wholesale jobs, jobs themselves might modify within the same job title. Um, but some portion of them are going to require engagement with new technology. So a critical part of this conversation is around um, skills, skill development and helping individuals kind of build um, into what those new jobs require. Um, so Morgan, I'm actually going to turn it to you again. So you, some of your work looks at skills development. Uh, what have you seen regarding the ability of in individuals to learn new skills? Um, and, you know, what are your thoughts around micro-credentialing or how to think about the broader con context around um, skill development? Sure. So I think that uh, HR departments and uh, public stakeholders who are worried about upskilling and, and reskilling their population, I think we have a lot of room to grow on this front. I see a lot of retraining programs that, that feel kind of naive. They're things like, uh, let's pick a job where employment appears to be growing. Uh, maybe like there's a lot of demand for computer programmers. So we'll just teach people Python. You can learn that online for free nowadays. Uh, and they'll be able to land jobs, maybe entry level jobs in computer programming. But what our work shows is that this strategy probably won't work because it's not just computer programming you need, it's actually a bundle of skills that together create the skill set required to be a, an effective computer programmer. So, for example, you can imagine that uh, not just an ability to write for loops, but also some mathematical background would be required to be an effective programmer. And then, never mind other social skills, things like being able to interact with a project team that's building this this system, this software. Uh, so, you really need to get beyond linking single occupations to one or two skills and understanding them holistically as a bundle of skill and task requirements so that we can effectively start uh, upskilling people with bundles of skills and tasks that makes them effective in the new, the new opportunity. For anyone, are, is there other types of skills in particular that are increasingly important um, these days? Gad, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think in a lot of uh, business-related jobs, and I'm thinking about marketing, sales, uh, HR, uh, there is a huge increase in the amount of data. And uh, But the, in order to make good use of that data, uh, there is a need for people in those departments to, to know how to use it, to ask the right questions and know how to answer them. So I think one thing that we are already seeing is that uh, in many, uh, so we use uh, online job postings to kind of measure skills and trends, um, trends in skills. So we see uh, that uh, the demand for tech and data analysis skills in those kinds of jobs are growing uh, very rapidly in recent years. Mm. I think another question, and I think this was brought up, um, you know, a little bit earlier, but how, how does this group think about college degrees? Are they still useful? Are they necessary? Is that changing over time? Um, Gad, we talked about this a little bit. What are your thoughts around are, if college degrees are as critical as they once were? Well, there is definitely a, a trend um, when we see it again in job postings that uh, the share of jobs that uh, or job ads that require a BA um, is declining uh, in recent years. Um, also other kinds of education, not just BA, but even also other post high school education uh, degrees and credentials are also uh, declining. I think uh, some of it is because there is indeed a trend of employers um, trying to target not just PAs, but also other people. I think in, in some cases, it's also a result of the labor shortage. When you are desperate to get someone, uh, you are willing to compromise on the, on the requirements. So I, I think we are uh, seeing um, a, a shift away a, a little from uh, college uh, degrees. Uh, we're also seeing uh, you know, wage growth in jobs that don't require BA. Um, has been much stronger than for jobs that do require BA in recent years. So also from the workers' perspective, in many cases, they're saying, uh, is it really worth it? Or can I have a, a good enough career without getting a, a BA? So that also mm. con contributes to the shift away from, uh, from BAs. Yeah. 
David, I believe Neuro is doing work with community colleges. Um, did I get that right? And if I did, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So, for example, um, very close by, there's a community college called De Anza. And we, we approached De Anza and we talked to them about what we were doing here, how we're building vehicles, and that these vehicles are uni unique. They're custom. They've never been built before. Uh, essentially, nobody knows how to work on them unless you work here at Neuro. So we talked to them about building a fleet technician program. So you, you, can, you can go now to De Anza College and sign up for these courses to be a fleet technician or a fleet technician supervisor. Um, so this is, this is brand new. It's never been done before. And here it is, AI actually empowering people to have new jobs that they didn't have. And when we think about the proliferation of this service and think about this kind of a job and how you can qualify for it literally with one course, that course can provide you good wages. And these, and these um, jobs can be fanned out across the country. They're not going to be uh, concentrated in specific places like here in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. We're operating in Houston. We'll be operating all across the country and people can stay where they are and earn a good wage. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's really interesting because several of the questions that came in were around how do we prepare the younger generation? You know, tips for high school students or how can a small liberal arts college prepare students for the changing needs of the workplace? Anyone have any thoughts around that? STEM. <laughs> so so we've been saying this for, uh, for decades now, uh, at least. And um, we just don't we just don't have enough enough graduates of high schools here in the United States who are interested enough or prepared enough um, to go to colleges to learn the skills required uh, that are needed for, for AI. And so as I alluded to, so many of the jobs, the, the best qualified people for the jobs have been educated in other countries, particularly in China and in India. Um, and, and as we know, there's, there's real political tensions going on in the world right now, particularly with China. So when you think about our current dependence on, um, on foreign workers for these really important jobs for our, our economy, it focuses the microscope back on us and our early education system. And how do we get kids at much earlier ages to be interested in these fields and do the work required to go get the skills? Mm, yeah. I think I, another, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gad. I, I would add, um, um, yeah, I would definitely agree that STEM and any uh, data analysis related skill are uh, growing, the demand for them uh, is growing very rapidly. Uh, we are now in the midst of one of the biggest uh, tech booms and science booms ever, uh, and the demand for STEM workers is, is through the roof. So I would definitely uh, agree with that. I think another um, the skill of uh, uh, um, resilience, resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of did some analysis when we compared between leading companies and other companies, and so what what are the, uh, the different skill requirements between the two group? And resilience is one of the things that stood out the most. And perhaps I think. Um, in uh, with the current uh, mental health crisis that we are having in the US. Uh, uh, I, I think like uh, building a more resilient um, workforce is, uh, is a very important thing. You know, another one of the ways in which the indicator of a college degree is used is sort of dif differentiating the line between high skill and like low skill work. Um, Morgan, curious about, is that the right way to think about demarcation between, you know, skills requirements, upskilling, you know, higher low wage job opportunities? Is that, does, the, it, does that help us, you know, from a data perspective? Yeah, this is a really important question. Um, so a lot of the way that economists, uh, especially theoretical work, and what I see from management science and, and policy related to future of work issues, uh, they have this paradigm where you talk about workers abstractly as being high skill and cognitive or low skill and physical, uh, with the idea being that if you're cognitive, you're more adaptable and you'll be made more productive by technology. But if the work you're doing is physical and routine, then you're more likely to be replaced. 
but I think that this is great to a first order approximation, but we're missing out on a lot of information. If all we're doing is talking about workers as being high skilled or low skilled. Uh, first of all, what do you mean by high skilled? Am I a high skilled worker? How do you know? Uh, most people would say if you have a bachelor's degree, you, you're high skilled, but you, you, I think you'd agree that there's a lot of variation in what your employment prospects or wage prospects are, depending just on what you major in, thinking about just the population of people that do complete bachelor's degrees. So even just from that, we're missing out on a lot of information. I think that the reason we're missing out on this is because of the type of data that has been made available through federal sources, through places like the Department of Labor and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We get really excellent cross-sectional data on the economy, uh, but not so much insight into workforce development, and in particular into how college education uh, prepares you for different career trajectories. There's a lot of options that makes it recently possible to address this. So for example, uh, I'm working with the Open Syllabus Project, which is a, uh, an effort to collect all university syllabi from universities and departments offered all across the US. This is an ongoing effort, but they're making available a really large data set of what the learning objectives are across majors and universities, and even through the last couple of years across the US. Uh, there are other companies, for example, Burning Glass Technologies, Future Fit AI and Revelio Labs that are making available worker profiles, which include things like educational history and worker history, which gives us the ability to not just look at what happens to graduates immediately after they enter the workforce, which is data you can get from the US Department of Education, but also what happens to these people downstream. So for example, what are the differences in your education that might make you adaptable or resilient later in your career? or maybe give you access to different labor markets, uh, give you an ability to get a job in Silicon Valley compared to being that computer programmer in a rural community. We're just now getting access to data at the scale that would enable lots of research to actually learn about the dynamics at this important stage. Hmm. We touch on this a little bit, but I'm just curious, you know, there's a lot of questions around how do we make sure that we are creating a workforce in the U.S. to fill these future jobs? David, as a, from an employer perspective, it sounds like, you know, what you're seeing is we can't, uh, not yet, not enough. Um, what can we be doing? What can employers be doing to create the skills that they need for their own workforces? Well, I, I do think it's important to broaden our um, to broaden our discussion about what kinds of jobs. So, as we're talking about another kind of job that's ob that's obviously in the news a lot today is manufacturing. And so, we, for example, we're building a vehicle. Now, there's been a lot of activity in, in the legislature, and a bill recently signed, the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States, puts a lot of money toward trying to get companies like ours to onshore their manufacturing, particularly of, of electric vehicles. We are a producer of an electric vehicle. So we, for example, we've opened up a, an end of line manufacturing facility in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're going to be putting tens of millions of dollars into building this and hiring hundreds of people to help um, end of line manufacture our vehicles. So that is something to consider in terms of what, what is the whole panoply of jobs that can grow out of um, AI centered industries like ours. It's not mm -hmm. all it's not all jobs creating the AI, but there are so many jobs that are created surrounding it. And we do in fact have the education to support many of those jobs. And we at facilities like ours can do the on the job training for those kinds of jobs. Okay. If I can add, I think that as a country, we are in, in, in deciding what to teach. Uh, we are not, uh, uh, we're not uh, thinking uh, or the consideration of what the economy needs is not uh, the top uh, top consideration. And it's uh, being reflected, uh, for example, in the immigration policy, but also in the attitude toward uh, labor shortages. You would think that uh, we would want to prepare more workers to come to jobs that require, that they uh, have a bigger shortage, but uh, there isn't, to the best of my knowledge, that there isn't really an attempt to do that. 
And I would say even there is no real recognition uh, by many parts of uh, the government that there is a labor shortage problem. So if we can't uh, acknowledge that there is a problem, how are we going to solve it? Hmm. You know, that raises a sort of this is a little bit tangential, but it raises a question for me about nature of work, how it's changing. Um, for instance, remote work, you know, it's a lot of conversation right now around is remote work here to stay? What's going to happen? But also, what does that do for attractiveness of jobs? Presumably not all jobs can be done remotely. You know, how do we think about the labor shortage? Gad, I'm curious about your, your take there. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of, you know, if you're like, let's say, a nurse or a teacher and you're 40 years old, and uh, you're probably not going to change jobs because of the shift to remote work. But when you're now uh, at a younger stage of your career and you're thinking where to, uh, what career should I choose? I think now uh, the consideration of whether you can work from home is uh, becoming a really important one. So I'm concerned that many jobs in healthcare and teaching um, and, and other jobs that cannot be done from home are going to become uh, less attractive that, and that will uh, make the shortage an even uh, bigger problem. I, I hope and, you know, if you believe in uh, uh, active markets that, uh, that uh, adjust to changing uh, demand and supply, then you'd expect that the market will solve this problem by making uh, wages for jobs that cannot be done uh, remotely higher uh, compared to the past and, and vice versa. That may happen and that would certainly be some kind of a solution. Hmm. Question, query whether it will happen quickly enough. Yeah. Uh, I think that's like one of the open questions. Uh, Morgan, have you, has any of your work kind of focused on um, remote work and what we're seeing in the labor markets? Yeah, so uh, I think that this sudden shift to remote work has really highlighted uh, the need for ability to work with software and with these digital interfaces and to be an effective communicator over these different mediums. Uh, so this is not something that we're necessarily training for, but maybe something we would want to train for if this work from home trend does in fact continue moving forward. Um, you know, there's also a lot of other interesting implications for what a large scale stable work from home transition would do to things like what types of opportunities are available in cities compared to in rural areas. Uh, you can imagine that the workers who do have these abilities are going to have a lot more mobility and a lot more options compared to the their peers who aren't able to work effectively remotely or perhaps using these different digital media to achieve work. There are also some areas of work which have been well documented uh, that really require in-person interaction. Uh, there's a lot, of, I would say there's a lot of interesting work trying to get at exactly why, but innovation and creative activities appear to really benefit from in-person interactivity. And it's not so clear that uh, remote teams or working from home uh, can produce the same amount of innovation and the same amount of creative work in, in those areas. Now, the, the COVID pandemic creates a really interesting opportunity to test these ideas because the pandemic is clearly exogenous to what type of work you're doing. Uh, and it created this shock, which maybe was enough to get people to adapt. But I would say that the, the academic literature on this, the prevailing thought is that these types of innovative and creative activities are not going to do so well in this new medium. I mean, it's something that I hear being discussed all the time within the tech companies that I sort of, you know, I'm engaging. Um, it also kind of raises this interesting question back to what you were saying earlier, Morgan, about the grouping of skills that actually make like a, you know, learning Python effective and how bundling that bundle of skills to really make something effective might be impacted by whether or not there's in-person engagement or not. I could imagine those things being connected. Yeah, I agree. So we've done a little bit of work using uh, skills data, nationally representative skills data from the US Department of Labor, looking at how skills empirically get bundled together across different occupations. And then we're able to compare that to how workers change the skills they're leveraging over the course of their career as they move from job to job. 
Uh, and what we find is that it's not very random. People really make smooth, uh, gradual transitions in their skill sets over the course of their career, with the exception of when somebody kind of stops working and explicitly goes back to school. That seems to be an exception. So what this dynamic suggests is that if you're working in a job right now, or maybe you were working in a job in 2019 that didn't require a lot of digital interaction. So you weren't already using Slack, you weren't already using Zoom, uh, and you weren't already using email. Uh, maybe this sudden shift to now almost everything happens over Slack, Zoom, and email uh, it requires a bundle of skills that you weren't prepared for. Even if you had just one or two, probably everybody in the country has an email address, for example. Um, so that's our research is showing that, again, this idea that it's just one or two skills to get you through these transitions, it's not enough. I think we need to do more to understand how skills get bundled together and then how to deliver these bundles of skills to workers through retraining and, and upskilling. Okay. I think I'm going to turn to some of the questions that I've come in. And so these are just going to be a little bit free for all. If anyone has a perspective, please, you know, weigh in. So one of the questions that came in was around job titles and resumes. And so given the dynamics of, you know, changing work, future of work, what are the role of conventional job titles? And they, can they be, can job titles be transcended for effective upskilling? And I, what I, what I read into that question is like, do the titles convey skills effectively and are they part of sort of, um, might we rethink about titling to convey skill sets? That's how I read that, but, you know, mm -hmm. curious about anyone else's take here. Yeah, that's how I interpreted it as well. Um, it, as, as somebody who actually looks at different data sets, it's really interesting to see kind of how wild job postings data can be compared to the nice clean data you get from the Department of Labor, for example. So mm -hmm. the, the abstraction with which uh, federal agencies think about occupations, it's really different from how people see themselves. So I think that in practice, if you're looking at job postings and, and people's resumes and looking at the job titles, you are getting more information about what their skills are because of the greater specificity in the job title. But even then looking at, if you ask people, what skills do you use on the job? There's a bit of a bias there as well. People will tend to list whatever is, is hot at the moment, whatever is hypey, right? Everybody's a AI engineer right now. And whatever the next big thing is in, in 20 years, everybody will say that they're good at that as well. So I think that, uh, yes, I agree with the idea that it'd be nice to have better insights into kind of the atomic elements of what workers can do, which are what are the tasks you can perform? What skills do you have? Uh, but we're going to need to reform the types of data we have if we want to do that. Yeah. All right. Che no, I, just uh, kind of adding on this a little, uh, I, I think job titles are mostly uh, external looking, right? They're like, when you work with someone, you don't need to know their job title. You know exactly what they're doing. It's more like uh, people outside the company who, uh, you know, you want in a few words to describe what is it that you're doing. So I, I, I think for that purpose, uh, I don't know if there will be a, I think job titles will still be uh, important. Maybe they'll turn out to be a little longer or <laughs> maybe we'll see more of them. But I, I think for that purpose, the communication purpose, I think we'll still need them. Hmm. And what about expertise? How do you preserve expertise while upskilling or reskilling workforces? Um, what are some ways that expertise is preserved or transformed between human expert and AI symptoms, systems, excuse me? kind of a tough question, right? Because <laughs> yeah. very effective uh, AI systems should encode institutional knowledge or, or the, the, the knowledge and abilities that are currently encoded in what that worker can do. So presumably if a system is so good that a firm would want to invest in it, it's able to do some of the work the person is doing and do it cheaper uh, than, than what it costs for the person to do it. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange question, I'd say, to say, how do we encode expertise? 
So mm -hmm. I would I would say that maybe a more a question I'm interested in that's related is how do you encode uh, the the ecosystem when technology is there to disrupt uh, the way your 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 company runs? So you can imagine that you have your teams who perform different different tasks within your company. You have um, you know customer service, you have R and D, you have people doing marketing, uh, and you can imagine that they have their in their knowledge uh, within each of these different departments and all of a sudden a new technology comes and really reduces the need for so many people in marketing uh, if those people are able to adapt to other needs that the company has that aren't addressed by technology then that's going to be a greater uh, an easier transition both for the workers and for the company as it adapts to its new ability and its new needs with their investment in the new uh, the new information system so this kind of goes against the standard model of, of having really specialized workers and having this hierarchy within the firm, which is shown to make firms more productive. So there's a balance to be hmm. struck here uh, that I think we need to consider. Really interesting. You know, I, I saw a recent study that shows that uh, senior management is becoming older. Uh, and one of the, like, the age when you reach the C-suite or become a CEO is getting older. So, and one of the explanation was that work is becoming more complex and it takes more time to become an expert. So, uh, uh, so maybe uh, that's a trend. Yeah, that's interesting. Another question came in around laws and regulations. So maybe David, I'm going to toss this one over to you as the uh, chief legal and policy officer. Um, are there laws and regulations that are needed to assure commensurate increases to employee wages if efficiencies from technology are going to re result in reduced labor, um, you know, and, 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 you know, kind of the ecosystem that technology maybe will increase profit for the firm, but what's going to happen for workers and individuals? So I don't know, is there a role for policy laws, regulations in that context? Well, what we, what we see is um, over the past hundred years or more, we've been becoming an increasing, increasingly computerized world. Uh, the internet came along and now AI has come along and we've also become uh, increasingly automated. So you can go into a car factory now and on some, on some shop floors, see a few people running machines and, and not a lot of people doing welding. And we have a worldwide labor shortage and the price of labor has gone up significantly. So, so when we look at what the free market has done already, um, the free market already is, is supporting um, wages at, at a really high rate. And, and, and at this point, economies are worried that they're getting too high. So, right. so it, it currently governments are looking at this and saying, the problem is the opposite. For mm -hmm. a long time, we thought we didn't have enough wage growth, wage, wage growth. And all of a sudden we have too much wage growth. And all of a sudden throughout economies worldwide, we don't have enough people. Now, if you look at this in certain advanced uh, countries, if you go to Japan, South Korea, even the United States, Sweden, Italy, they're not reproducing enough to actually replace their workers. So we really have a worker shortage problem worldwide. And we probably are not going to keep up with that problem enough to where, autonom to where things like autonomy or AI are going to be the problem. Rather, the problem is we don't have the AI fast enough. Hmm. Interesting. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a role for agencies and nonprofits to um, help with uh, reskilling, uh, it, to the extent that we, that we, all, we do have AI that is uh, moving quickly enough. Do you guys think that, that like, there's a role for those types of, um, community organizations to help? I, I think there is a, a lot of room for research in that and, and, uh, to the degree that, uh, some non-for-profits can, uh, can do research in that area. I, I think that, that, uh, would help and, and also, Kind of implementing uh, that research in a in an employer level, um, 
I, I, I do think, for example, like when you talk, we say reskilling, so that's taking someone who has a current job and making them be able to work in a more complex job. So I think there's a lot of uh, um, a, a very tough question is uh, what, uh, what workers, uh, what jobs you're uh, going to take workers from. And there, there is a lot of information that could be helpful. For example, the skills uh, adjacency, like how similar those two jobs are in how, uh, in, in how similar the skills that they require are. But also looking at actual transitions, uh, like if you have a, a shortage of, uh, uh, of uh, cybersecurity uh, analysts, uh, what in the past, what kind of uh, workers moved into that uh, occupation? So I, I think uh, knowing more about that uh, would help a lot in uh, making successful transitions and uh, reskilling. I wanted to add my two cents also, which is I think there's plenty of work that nonprofits can do here. Uh, I think that it's, it's kind of a privileged situation when you are able to look at the frontier and, and have the, the view, the vantage to start to identify, well, you know, I should go to college, I should learn data skills and some basic uh, computer usage skills. That, that's sort of a privileged position. And so one obvious thing nonprofits can do is to help disadvantaged communities get access to these, these uh, opportunities to learn relevant skills. I think also different elements of the digital economy are creating these uh, potentially short-term employment opportunities. So Andrew Ang in his talk, he, he talked about uh, that we need people who can create new data sets to train these, these uh, AI systems for fringe applications. And he pointed to uh, prompt engineering as a new type of work that uh, Stable Diffusion has created and GPT-3 has created. Uh, so we need people who are going to be proficient in that. Uh, but and the, so the benefit of these things is that they can be done by anyone anywhere in the world. They just basically need a computer and some internet, and they could be an effective worker for this type of work. Uh, but I wonder how good these jobs really are. Are they interesting? Are they actually stable? Or will we have mm -hmm. AI systems that, for example, through the next generation of unsupervised learning, don't actually need this labeled data set? Um, and I can imagine prompt engineering being so generic that anyone on any Zoom call with the Brookings Institution can just be typing in prompts and start making these, these beautiful pictures. Uh, I wonder uh, how good of a job that will be since anyone really can do it. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is it creates a disparate workforce. It's hard for a workforce, which is just people scattered all over the globe, to come together and to leverage their uh, collective interests against say the interests of the employer. And I think it's probably healthier for there to be a balance of, of power between employer and employees. And it's just very difficult when people aren't face to face. So mm -hmm. nonprofits have another opportunity to make sure that, that disparate workers are able to come together uh, and have the means and mechanisms to achieve that. So maybe the most relevant example of this is there are some cities where Uber drivers have come together and started demanding certain uh, certain rights and, and, and goods from Uber because of their, their work there. But this is a rarity, it isn't the norm quite yet. It also raises another question. I mean, this question around data sets is, um, is discrimination and bias that can be inherent in sort of the data sets that are being used. And that's one of some of the questions that were coming in were around, how do we think about ethical considerations in a lot of the AI and autom in automation that's happening? So one question might be like, how do we ensure that discrimination that is being, that, you know, that is prevalent in everyday society isn't sort of being replicated um, in our AI systems. One of the qu questions that comes up a lot is around um, stuff that's using fo for facial recognition technology. Um, but the you know, a, a bias that's inherent in the data sets is then being ported over into some of the automated technologies. Um, that's is curious about anyone's thought there. And then also I think, um, I think a related question um, that came in was around, how, should we be focusing on designing AI and automation 
that is um, augmenting rather than replacing people. And again, sort of thinking about it from a more, from a perhaps a ethical perspective. Well, from a, from a policy perspective, it is a it is a valid question, and um, the U.S. government is looking at it, and and so are other governments. And governments are are going to have to learn a lot from each other on this, and um, work really hard not to not to overstep. The the issue is that AI learns in a way that people don't quite know how they're making their decisions. It's, it's very interesting that the AI programmer um, puts together a program. And, and teaches it how to learn, it learns to make decisions, but the programmer doesn't know exactly how it makes decisions. So this does raise the question about, is it making the decisions that say a company wants to rely upon that actually may help the company make certain decisions, release certain products, but might it be doing something that um, it's, it's making decisions discriminatorily? It's a valid question that I think governments look at. At the same time, when they do it, generally speaking, the way a lot of a lot of governments um, legislate is they don't learn enough about it, and they may come up with a very blunt instrument, which can really get in the way of the technology doing very good things for the world. So, for example, there are there are studies showing that AI can be used with its imaging technology to detect skin cancers potentially better than the world's most well-trained. Um, skin cancer doctor might be able to. Now, you wouldn't want to get in the way of these life-saving technologies by putting a really blunt legislative instrument in place. So we need to look at it, but it needs to be handled very cautiously. If I can add, I, I think uh, AI could also uh, add transparency. And one of the reasons why uh, it's how to, to reduce uh, let's say, underrepresentedness of uh, women and minorities in high paying jobs is because you don't know uh, how companies are doing in this regard uh, for the most part. But uh, using AI, uh, you can, I, I think we are not far and probably within a year or two, we will know uh, how much uh, companies are hiring women and minorities in high paying jobs uh, using uh, social profiles data. Um, that would uh, kind of remove the the mask and uh, and allow much more transparency. That could then lead to uh, actual change in policies and companies trying to do better. Yeah. So I think this is a really topical question. Uh, I believe that just this week the White House announced new guidelines for for AI and data driven systems. So. It seems that there's a lot to come on what the ethical infrastructure around AI will be in the U.S. moving forward. Um, one of the things that they list, they don't really offer many solutions. They really point to problems in, the, in their uh, statement. But one of the things is that people should have the right to opt out. They should have the right to, where reasonable, uh, not be included in data, but also have a right to deal with a person instead of with an automated system. So that's a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, thing. And that we need safeguards for ethical AI decision-making. Now, I think that if you start asking computer scientists about this question, they'll say, well, the examples we've seen are all examples of garbage in, garbage out. We're training systems on empirical data that reflects our society's biases. So really, we're just seeing a reflection of ourselves. Uh, and that we can fix this if we just you know, augment data in an artificial way that's less empirical, that somehow removes the biases that we don't want in our systems. Uh, so you know, there's, there's a lot of, strictly speaking, that is how machine, supervised machine learning works. But when you see these AI systems coming from these, these major tech companies, so the, the, the facial recognition example, not failing to detect black faces. I believe that that was tested with uh, facial recognition software from Facebook and from Microsoft, which are companies we've all heard of, of course. Uh, so it really begs the question, what should the institutions and institutional safeguards be for these types of systems to prevent this type of garbage in, garbage out from passing all, uh, all the way up to deployment? And this is a really hard question. Basically, I think we need more research here. You can imagine some type of really strange system 
where there's sort of a shared platform where companies are able to uh, upload the compiled code and run it against a suite of different scenarios uh, that somehow certify that, all right, yes, this, this software detects black faces, it doesn't bias based on gender, it doesn't bias based on uh, health conditions, uh, or maybe this software isn't applicable to this test, it has nothing to do with uh, medical conditions or anything like that. You can imagine creating a whole suite of scenarios, but even just having such a system, this double-sided market, if you will, uh, would be an incredible engineering uh, problem to solve in the first place. So I think there's a lot of barriers, both technically and then kind of institutionally to creating the safeguards we need to meet these goals from the White House. Okay. All right. Well, I think that we're at time. So I will leave it here. Um, thank you all for um, speaking with us today. It was really, really a uh, wonderful panel. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right.